welcome to episode 100. On the track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy! In the depths of winter, when a blanket of snow covers the ground, the landscape becomes strange and mysterious. It does not take too much of a flight of fancy to imagine that strange, grotesque creatures from the north have come down with the snow clouds and are wandering unfettered amongst the world of men leaving footsteps in the snow. Monstrous footsteps. Is it a yeti? No, it's Wally the comedy rhinoceros. What is Wally doing trudging through the snow? Where is he going? Why is he doing it? And does any of it matter? You're just going to have to watch to find out. My name's John Dyans. And my name's Charlotte Phillipson. And welcome to another episode of on the track. The Centre for Fortean Zoology is the largest, and we like to think the best, Mr Animal Research Group in the English-speaking world. For over 25 years we have been publishing books, releasing magazines, making films, and sending expeditions all over the world to research mystery animals, creatures that are known by the people who live in a specific location, but whose existence is not yet accepted by mainstream science. And each month Charlotte and I present this show, which we hope very much that you'll enjoy watching. If you feel that you'd like to get more involved with what we do, please feel free to contact me at the link below. And also below there's a link to our Patreon page, but we'll talk more about that later. I came for the crypto. And stayed for the zoology. And now I guess it's time to get on with the show. Owls? Everyone loves owls, especially, it turns out, my granddaughter Evelyn. Is that nice, Evelyn? You're gorgeous. You're lucky. Lucky girl. Last month, Evelyn went on holiday with Karina, my son-in-law and my two girls. And as you can see, she fell in love with owls. He's going to keep turning his head. Lucky girl. But already there's a mystery. What is this? Carl and I were left at home with Graham looking after Mother and keeping the home fires burning and watching the videos which were sent over the ether to us from the expeditionary force at Centre Parks every evening. But we can't identify this owl. The other owl with whom Evelyn made friends was an African white-faced owl, a species that I'd never seen before. I like his whiskers. But the first owl remains a complete mystery. It looks a little bit like a darker version of the British tawny owl, this species here. But are the darker specimens is there a well-known darker colour morph, or are we barking, or hooting, completely up the wrong tree? A month or so later, Carl and I still don't know, and we haven't, I must admit, got around to writing to centre parks to asking them what species it is. But I'll tell you what we did do. In a social phenomenon that happens whenever two or more cryptozoologists get together and there's a bottle of gin involved,
we ended up talking about cryptids. And because we'd already started the evening talking about owls, we ended up talking about cryptic owls, and we were quite surprised to find out how many there actually are. Over to you, Carl. OK, we have the Andaman Wood Owl, which is a, a strange owl-like creature reported from the dense forests of Andaman and Nicobar Islands in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's believed to be an unknown species of wood owl. But of course, there are lots of other strange things happening in the Andaman Islands. I don't know about you, but I think it's absolutely awe-inspiring that even now, well into the 21st century, there are people living on this planet who have not been properly contacted by what we laughingly call civilization. And the most notable of these live on a little island called North Sentinel in the Andaman Islands, an Indian archipelago in the Bay of Bengal. It is home to the Sentinelese, a people who have rejected, often violently, any contact with the outside world, and they are amongst the last uncontacted people to remain virtually untouched by modern civilization. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands Protection of Aboriginal Tribes Act of 1956 prohibits travel to the island and any approach closer than five nautical miles in order to prevent the resident tribespeople from contracting diseases to which they have no immunity, and the area is patrolled regularly by the Indian Navy. The Sentinelese have repeatedly attacked approaching vessels. This resulted in the death of two fishermen in 2006 and an American missionary, John Allen Chow, in 2018. One is always sad at needless loss of life, but I'm afraid that, in my opinion, if somebody shows the incredible arrogance to fly in the face of international legislation in order to attempt to bring his own belief system to a group of people whom the international community have left alone for thousands of years just because he feels that he has a mandate to from his particular god is absolutely foolhardy and it is not at all surprising what happened to him. But whatever, it is undeniable that the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are one of the most remote and little explored places on Earth. If a whole tribe of people can live on this island and we know practically nothing about them, then the chances for there being an unknown species of owl there are very high indeed. Next we head over to Sri Lanka, where we have the devil bird, known locally as Ulama. It is said to emit a blood-curdling human-sounding shriek in the night from the deep rainforest. In Sri Lankan folklore, it is believed that the devil bird's cry is an omen of certain death. The Kikiayan is said to be an owl-like creature reported from Africa. Also known as the soul cannibal, it is described as resembling a large owl. In many respects, it is a mixture of bird and human characteristics. Owls may be responsible for legends of the Javan Ahul. The Ahul is said to have a wingspan in excess of 10 feet. Sightings of Ahuls are often dismissed simply as mistaken observations of owls, eagles and other birds of prey that inhabit the same rainforests. Owlman is the name given to a large owl-like creature similar to legends of the Mothman. The first sightings took place in 1976 in the village of Mornan, Cornwall. Tony Doc Shields came forward claiming that he had investigated a report of two young girls on holiday in Mornan who witnessed a large winged creature hovering above the church tower. In 1995, a female tourist visiting Chicago wrote to the Western Morning News in Truro claiming to have seen a birdman with a ghostly face, a wide mouth, glowing eyes and pointed ears, as well as clawed wings. Now John will probably sulk if I don't mention the fact that he wrote the most famous book about the Owl Man. It's available from all good bookstores! But, back to the real world, Evelyn wasn't the only one to make friends with an owl. This is me, 
with a European eagle owl. But amazingly, Carl tells us how these fantastic birds are breeding in 21st century Britain. Recent news that a pair of eagle owls nesting in North Yorkshire has restarted the controversy around one of the largest owls in the world. The Scots Gaelic, Manx, Welsh, Cornish and Irish Gaelic languages all have words for them and it is generally agreed that fossil records indicate eagle owls were present in Britain from some 700,000 years ago to at least 10,000 years ago. But the evidence for their more recent persistence is inconclusive. There are currently claimed to be 12 to 40 pairs of eagle owls nesting in Britain, but no one is certain of how many of these have escaped from captivity and how many have naturally immigrated here from Europe. The historic records from Orkney, 1830, Shetland, 1863 and 1871, and Argyll, 1883, all seem likely to be genuine. This is a species that has to overcome persecution, the accumulation of pesticides in the food chain, and collisions with vehicles, barbed wire and power lines. The British Trust for Ornithology states that they have been breeding here for 20 years. So coupled with its expansion across continental Europe, this species appears to be surviving against all odds. And there have even been reports from North Devon, a few miles away from the CFZ headquarters. This is Paula's Peace, one of the most atmospheric and strange places in the vicinity of the village in North Devon where we live. And over the years I have received three separate accounts of people having witnessed what they describe as a giant owl flying through this tunnel of trees. Could it be an eagle owl? Or could it be something completely different? Only time will tell. But back to my granddaughter at Centre Parks. I think that the people in charge of Centre Parks deserve to be congratulated for this initiative which introduces young people, a new generation of children, to the beauties and intricacies of the natural world in a way which I think is highly unlikely that they shall ever forget. But now for something that I think you have all been waiting for. Dang, dang, dang. As we speak, John's talking to him on the telephone. So, Max, what were you doing in Russia? That is classified. Boys, boys. Back in the autumn, when we were visiting Jersey Zoo, I filmed these bears. They are Andean or spectacled bears, and they are the only species of bear in South America. This means, of course, that Paddington must have been one of these bears, as he came from Darkest Pro. But John found something else about them. The giant short-faced bear was amongst the most terrifying predators ever to appear on the North American continent. It lived at a time when the dire wolf, the American lion, and the saber-toothed cat known as Smilodon roamed the landscape. As formidable as these legendary carnivores were, all would have given way to the short-faced bear. Arctotherium was named by Hermann Burmeister in 1879, and one specimen from Berners Aries shows an individual estimated using the humerus to weigh between 983 and 2,042 kilograms, that's 2,167 and 4,502 pounds, although the authors do consider the upper limit as improbable and say that it was probably only 3,501 to 3,856 pounds. It is, however, still the largest bear that has ever been found and contender for the largest carnivorous land mammal ever known. According to modern science, this massive beast vanished from North America around 11,000 years ago. However, some believe that it could still exist today in the far northern reaches of the continent. 
These claims are backed by historical accounts of huge or strange bears and occasional evidence in the form of pelts and other specimens. There are many unofficial reports of enormous brown bears with whopping proportions without valid proof. Experts will generally write these encounters off as poorly guessed measurements or perhaps only the tall tales of hunters and outdoorsmen. However, when the stories are backed by evidence or at least reliable testimony, the issue does become more interesting. Bergman's bear is one such case. On the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia, locals claim sightings of bears much bigger than the typical local brown bears. Known as the god bear, this creature is said to have a unique appearance and a massive frame. Back in 1920, zoologist Stena Bergman examined a pelt alleged to come from one such animal and believed that it was a subspecies of brown bear unlike those known in the area. He also noted footprints larger than what he'd have expected from the local bears. Some cryptozoologists have suggested that Bergman's bear is actually the giant short-faced bear which somehow managed to survive extinction in the remote regions of Russia. Biologists mostly dismiss this notion for a number of reasons. For one thing, Arctodus lived in North America and is not known in Asia. However, due to the exchange of animals migrating between North America and Asia via the Bering Land Bridge during the last ice age, it is not inconceivable that a population of short-faced bears could have ended up on the Kamchatka Peninsula. Secondly, with its long limbs, the short-faced bear would have had a different appearance than a typical brown bear, one that does not match up with its description given by locals. As Bergman speculated, the bear he examined most likely belongs to a unique, possibly physically larger subspecies of the modern brown bear. Some suggest this subspecies may now be extinct, while others think that it may still be active in areas of Kamchatka, cordoned off by the military. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, it turns out that Paddington's relatives, the South American Spectacle Bears, are the last remaining short-faced bears. Its closest relatives are the extinct Florida Spectacle Bear that became extinct at the end of the last ice age 10,000 years ago, possibly as late as 8,000 years ago at Devil's Den in Florida, due to some combination of climate change and hunting by the newly arrived Paleo-Indians. Now, can you imagine what would have happened if a specimen of Arctodus simus was running loose on Paddington Station? Forget leaves on the line or the wrong type of snow, that would truly give British National Rail Network something to worry about. Ding dong! The 4.30 to Asia is 20 minutes late because a paleolithic carnival has run a lock on platform B. Thank you. And now another example of how great our government is. Endangered British birds are to be killed under permits, which could fuel an illegal pan-European trade. Licence holders will be allowed to kill some of Britain's most endangered bird species under temporary permits licensed by Natural England and Natural Resources Wales. The monitoring and enforcement of these permits relies on self-reporting and regulation loopholes which could be exploited to feed the demand for illegal bird products in Europe. The birds at risk throughout England and Wales include species whose numbers are threatened in the UK, according to the RSPB. Bullfinches, meadow pipits and oyster catchers are all included in the permits and are amber listed for intermediate conservation priority. Another species, the skylark, will be subject to licensed killing despite the RSP red listing it as a critical conservation priority for the UK. Both Natural England and Natural Resources Wales are sponsored by central government and are responsible for promoting nature conservation and protecting people and the environment according to their websites. They cite safety concerns to justly granting the permits and claim killing birds could prevent damage to crops and reduce interference with air traffic. Although the permits strictly outline the overall number of birds that are allowed to be killed, monitoring and enforcing this will be crucial. 
The illegal bird trade within the European Union is thought to be worth at least 10 million euros a year. This doesn't just refer to the trade in exotic species from outside Europe, but includes the widespread trade of songbirds for human consumption, particularly in parts of France and northern Italy, where songbirds are regarded as a forbidden delicacies. The trade in songbirds makes for quick profits. One gram of songbird meat is estimated to sell for the equivalent of one gram of marijuana. The trapping and consumption of songbirds is widely illegal across the European Union, but it still occurs illegally in some member states such as France and Italy. Although the 1981 UK Wildlife and Countryside Act forbids wild birds being sold for food or shot for sport, enforcing this rule may be difficult to guarantee under the permits. There is cause to worry that songbird killing and trapping opportunities in the UK could prove to be another supply route for pan-European trade. Policing those who are issued permits may encounter the same problems that regulating the protection of birds has met elsewhere in the UK. The RSPB published a report in 2017 that found a striking 67% of crimes against birds of prey in the UK were committed by gamekeepers and that self-regulation has evidently failed. Other studies also found a correlation between the persecution of birds of prey and grouse shooting. For example, where birds of prey pose a hindrance to grouse shooting, gamekeepers may destroy their nests. Although complex structures are in place to prosecute wildlife crime in the UK, the RSPB found that in 2017 only 4 out of 68 cases of crimes against birds of prey were prosecuted. Given these difficulties in enforcing existing regulations, how can we be certain that those songbirds which are legally trapped or killed in the UK do not feed the demand for illegal songbirds in European restaurants? We have a pond in our garden and the other day Mum and I found frogs born in it. We were quite pleased as we have always tried to make it a wildlife pond and we only put it in last summer. When I told John about this, he got very excited and came up with a useful experiment that we could do. It's not cryptozoology, but it's pretty close. When I was a boy and lived here in North Devon, the frog population used to always spawn about halfway through March, and maybe again in early April. Something that we've noticed over the years is that whenever we've tried to raise tadpoles from spawn that was laid in January or February, we've never managed it. However, every time we've tried to raise tadpoles from spawn laid in March or April, we've never had any problem whatsoever. Which makes me wonder, is there any way that these tadpoles or this spawn is never meant to reach maturity? Is there any way that it could actually be meant to die off in the first frosts that come along? And if so, why? And the obvious answer to me is that the half-grown tadpoles are meant to be killed by the frost so they can rot down and produce, if you like, a high-protein injection to these roadside ponds and ditches where the frogs lay their spawn each winter. But I want to test this theory. So the first thing I want to do is to see if Charlotte is any better at rearing the Heartland tadpoles than we have been at rearing the Woolsbury ones. She's also taking regular photographs of the spawn and eventually the tadpoles in her pond and comparing them against the development of the spawn and the tadpoles that she's keeping in a tank indoors. This is, I think, a very fascinating project and I look forward to telling you all what transpires. Well, I don't know why we always seem to manage to not make friends and influence people, but the latest has come out from people who should we not name is that the CFZ is a cult, and I am somehow its cult leader. This is a public service announcement. The Centre for Fortune Zoology isn't just an organisation dedicated to studying mystery animals. It's also a family. 
an ever-growing family with people in different parts of the world all contributing to be part of something which we think is really rather good. What's he talking about? Some dodgy old hippie living out in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of people he calls his family? I've never heard of such a thing. Karina, calls for another June buggy home. Oh, not again. It's all a bit out of skelter in that house, isn't it? Now, boys now and boys girls, and what girls, do we girls, have yeah. here? And now it's time for a brand new feature for the show. It's time for On the Track Product Placement. There are all sorts of people who are friends and relations of the CFZ and people who are members of the CFZ themselves who do all sorts of peculiar things. And now, each episode, we're going to give a brief roundup of some of these aforementioned things. Right, Weird Weekend North is back on the 6th and 7th of April 2019 at Victon with Glazebrook Community Hall. This year we have yet again another very strong lineup of talks. We have Dr. Rob Gandhi talking about Russington Horror. This strange and mysterious horror sighting we'll be finding more about. Steve Mera will be talking about the connection between UFO portals and the paranormal. Andy Moss will be looking into the story of the Durham Puma, that most mysterious of feline cryptids. Christopher Joseph and Chris Hill will be talking about Jeff, the very strange and extra special talking mongoose. Nathan Jackson will be giving a lecture on BHMs the world over, looking at some of the big hairy monsters that can be found worldwide. Glenn Vaudry will be looking at the Risley Silver Man mystery, was it an alien that turned up in Risley in 1978, or something completely different? Steve Jones will be recalling the ghosts for Tears Net and other weird happenings that have occurred. James Newton will be looking at reports of Dogman. This upright, dog-faced Bigfoot will be uh, well worth listening to. Richard Freeman will be giving uh, a report on his expedition to Tajikistan, looking for the goal. Cal Marshall will be discussing the British big cats, hopefully providing us with some new information on this most elusive of creature. And Bob Fisher will be turning up as well, with once again one of his most interesting talks, that so far we have to keep secret. So once again, that's the 6th and 7th of April, at the of Glazebrook Community Hall, and a ticket for one day is £15, for both days, it's just £30. One of the best deals you'll get for any talk like this. And now it's over to Karina for a monthly visit to the Watcher of the Skies. I have always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird. A highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other Old World raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have. And that's what this segment from the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals. And in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the skies. And... hello again. I'm afraid our arches is taking up Prudence's space, Prudence is taking up Archie's space, but the fire isn't on, but I don't think she's realised that yet, so we'll see what happens. A group of up to seven short-eared owls has taken up residence on Aberdeenshire's Forby National Nature Reserve. They arrived in October last year and have attracted wildlife watchers and photographers. Ron MacDonald, a former Scottish natural heritage 
I'm afraid Ron McDonald is Ronald McDonald, isn't it? Yeah. Can't use that because it's copyrighted to the Golden Arches. Ronald McDonald, a former Scottish Natural Heritage Manager, said, Short-eared owls are a dream to photograph because they fly in daylight, often slowly, and perch on posts and they make fantastic portraits, although they can be tricky to photograph when flying against the background of heath and dunes. But with some basic field craft and photo skills, you will soon get the hang of it. From 1970 to 2010, short-eared owls disappeared from almost half of its former UK breeding range, according to the British Trust for Ornithology. <coughs> the current UK population is estimated to be between 610 and 1,240 pairs and is a rare breeding bird. A rare Teng Mams owl, also known as the Boreal Owl, has been spotted in Shetland, and the sighting is believed to have been the first of the breed in Shetland in over a century. It was observed after sweeping into a garden at Tumbling on the west side of the islands, and former wildlife photographer Dennis Coote said the last one officially recorded in Shetland was back in 1912. It's a small owl, and in Europe it is typically known as the Tengmalm's owl, after Swedish naturalist Peter Gustaf Tengmalm, or, more rarely, Richardson's owl, after Sir John Richardson, the Scottish ornithologist. It ranks as one of, if not the, least known owl in both North America and Europe. Hugh Harrop, wait for it, <laughs> Hugh Harrop of Shetland Wildlife described the Teng Mums Owl as an incredibly rare bird in Britain. Only 20 records, most in Orkney, exist for the bird in the UK since 1901. John Coots added, the Teng Mums Owl is a very rare vagrant from Northern Europe and Siberia and will be a new bird for all Shetland listers. <coughs> Britain's largest bird of prey has been spotted in the Hampshire countryside recently. A young white-tailed eagle, a species which has made an appearance only twice in the area in the past decade, in the New Forest. According to the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust, the UK's largest bird of prey was last seen in the county in 2011 and 2008, and before that there, were, there was a 60-year gap. Also known as a sea eagle, it was sighted at the Trust's reserve at Blashford's Lakes last month. Mm -hmm. And again by the Shell Station. Oh, can I, say, can, I say, can I say Shell Station? That's advertising. At a petrol station on the A31 at Picket Post, which overlooks Row Enclosure. A Hampshire and Isle of Wight wild tribe. Wildlife Trust spokesperson said white-tailed eagles are a rare sighting in Hampshire with only two previous sightings in the past 11 years. They're an impressive sight to see being the UK's largest bird of prey with a wingspan of up to 2.2 metres which is over 11 feet but are usually only found in Scotland where 40 pairs breed. We suspect that this juvenile bird is visiting from Scandinavia where there is a larger more established and expanding population. The species was persecuted to extinction before being reintroduced to the UK on the Isle of Mull off the west coast of Scotland in the 1970s. The bird is ringed, but as yet its origin has not been possible to, to trace, and it may well be a young bird from a breeding pair in the Netherlands, where species have been recovering its numbers. A muscovy duck has been spotted among a family of mallards at the dock. Dock? At the duck pond at Fleetwoods Memorial Park. Although Muscovy ducks are not native to Britain, over the years lots of individuals have either escaped from private collections or been released onto park lakes where they tend to thrive, hence they can regularly be seen across the country. A spokesman said Fleetwood does have a good track record of producing rare or interesting birds, however, as well as beating as boasting a great selection of habitats and birds that can be found all year round. Native to Mexico, Central and South America, they are large heavy birds with short legs, broad wings and a horizontal carriage. That's a strange explanation. 
They're excellent flyers too. They are also the only breed of domestic duck that is not descended from the wild mallard, but belongs to a group known as the greater wood duck. A rare Richard's Pipit has been discovered at a South Tyneside coastal beauty spot. This species usually spends its winters in India and Southeast Asia, but this one has remained in South Tyneside for a month. It is thought the small brown bird has travelled around 4,300 miles from its breeding ground from Siberia to South Shields. A Mr. Ahmed, who has been interested in birds from an early age, said, No one really knows how it has ended up here. I've measured the distance from approximately the centre of Richard's, Pip Richard's Pipit's breeding range to South Shields in GIS. It's about 4,300 miles or 6,900 kilometres, a staggering distance for a bird that could fit in the palm of your hand. There have been suggestions that it had blown up course by the wind during migration. Richard, Richard's Pipit breeds in open grasslands and is a solitary bird which feeds on insects, larvae and seed. It is noticeable for its long hind claws and upright stance. The British Ornithologists Union Records Committee, or the BOURC, has added the falcated duck to the British list. This species has been considered for admission to the British list on a number of occasions over the years and is often the case with wildfowl. The issue was not of identification, which is relatively straightforward, but to decide the origin of individuals, which could either be from the wild or escapes from captive collections, as the species is kept widely. After the careful consideration of a number of plausible candidates, the committee decided, by a two-thirds majority, that the Welmy Norfolk bird, first seen in December 1986, subsequently observed at sites in Northamptonshire and again at Welmy until March 1988, was eligible for Category A. This duck bird... This duck bird... This duck birds... in Mongolia! This duck breeds in Mongolia. I must do this in bigger type next time because this, the mixture of these glasses, distance and the type is not working very well. The duck breeds in Mongolia, eastern Siberia and northeast China and migrates south to winter to northern India, south and eastern China, south Korea and Japan. Further details will be published as part of the BOURC's 50th report due to be published in IBIS in October 2019. These changes will be published as part of the BORC's 50th report due to be published to IBIS. I've said that. I need to do a little bit more checking of my stuff as well. <laughs> anyway, upon publication of this change, the British list stands at 619 species category A equals 601 and category, category B equals 8 and category C equals 10. And that's it for now for this episode. So now it's over to John for the usual look at new and rediscovered species. Farewell. You have to admit that this is a wonderful looking fish. Gymneogeophagus jarii is a new species of cichlid described from southern tributaries of the middle Piranha in Paraguay. It can be distinguished from all other members of the genus, except for G. australis and G. cacoazensis, by the presence of a hyaline to grey anterior portion of the dorsal fin. This new species, based on a mitochondrial DNA phylogeny, is the sister species of G. Cazocorensis from the Paraguay Basin and is closely related to G. australis. Gymneogeophagus jarii differs from these other species in a range of morphological characteristics, including coloration and scalation, but one of the most interesting and notable characteristics of this new species is the possession of a neutral hump in adult males. Neutral humps are an enlarged lump of tissue that develops on the forehead of some cichlids. They mostly develop on male cichlids, but females sometimes get them as well, and some may never develop them. 
It is not known why neutral humps grow so differently. It could be based on genetics, dominance, quality of life, etc. And in the aquarium trade, cichlids with the largest neutral humps will sell for the highest prices. My favourite species with a neutral hump is a Cyphotilapia fontosa from Lake Tanganyika in East Africa, and one day I shall fulfil my ambition of keeping them. A man has to dream. Something which I find really rather touching is that the species name is derived from the Guarani word Jariai, meaning grandmother. It's dedicated to the non-governmental organisation of Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo, created in 1977, whose objective is to locate and restore to their legitimate families all the children that disappeared in the last Argentine dictatorship. See, I can even bring politics into tropical fish. This month's new and rediscovered creatures are truly a bunch of cuties. Look at this delightful little reptile. This is a new, critically endangered species of soft-shelled turtle, Panodiscus variegatus, which has been described from north-central Vietnam and Hainan Island in China. It is distinguished by a unique set of genetic and morphological traits from all other congeners. Morphologically, P. variegatus is characterised, amongst other things, by its strong ventral ornamentation in all age classes. I'm a great fan of soft-shell turtles and have kept several different species over the years. They're called soft-shell because, guess what, their carapaces lack horny scales or scutes. The carapace is leather and pliable, particularly at the sides. The central part of the carapace has a layer of solid bone beneath it, as in other turtles, but this is absent at the outer edges. Some species also have dermal bones in the plastron, but these are not attached to the bones of the shell. The light and flexible shell of these turtles allows them to move more easily in open water or in muddy lake bottoms. Having a soft shell also allows them to move much faster on land than most turtles. Their feet are webbed and are three-clawed, hence the family name Trionicidae, which means three-clawed. The carapace colour of each type of soft-shell turtle tends to match the sand or mud colour of its geographical region, assisting in their lion's weight feeding methodology. Soft-shells are able to breathe underwater with rhythmic movements of their mouth cavity that contains numerous processes that are copiously supplied with blood, acting similarly as gill filaments in fish. This enables them to stay underwater for far longer than they would otherwise have been able to do. Fantastic little creatures. I am also very fond of snakeheads, pugnacious but incredibly beautiful fish of the Persiform or perch-like order in the family Chanidae, native to parts of Africa and Asia. These elongated predatory fish are distinguished by their long dorsal fins, large mouths and shiny teeth. They breathe air with gills which allows them to migrate short distances over land. They have superbranchial organs which develop when they grow older, which are primitive forms of labyrinth organs. The two extant genera are Chana in Asia and Parachana in Africa, consisting of about 50 species. They are valuable as a food source and have become notorious as an intentionally released invasive species. A new Chana species described from River Torsa of Brahmaputra River Basin in West Bengal, India, Chana torsiensis is distinguished from congeners by a combination of the following characters, namely a dorsal, anal and caudal fins being bluish with a broad or dark blue border having a tinge of orange, dorsal fin with numerous black spots, caudal fin with 9 to 10 black bands, 5 to 6 oblique greyish blue bands present on the body amongst many other characteristics. But this isn't all. Still in India, Chanalipo, a new species of snakehead of the C. Gachua species group, has been described based on 11 specimens from Meghalaya, northeast India. It is distinguished from its congeners by possessing an orange, bronze, brown dorsum and fins, 9 to 12 black spots or blotches on the dorsal fin submargin, appearing parallel along the length of the dorsal fin base. 
six oblique brown bars on the upper half of the flank, presence of seven grey to brown zigzag bands on the caudal fin and fewer anal fin rays. The specific epithet Lepor indicates the local vernacular name for the species in Khasi language, a dialect spoken by the Khasi tribes of Meghalaya, so this is truly a cryptozoological species, being ethno-known to the extent of even having a dialect name before finally being discovered by scientists. And although there were dozens more species described this month, we only have a certain amount of room and our resources are finite, but this last one is a real doozy. A giant tortoise believed extinct for over a hundred years has been described on the Galapagos island of Fernadina, Ecuador's environment minister said in late February. An adult female specimen of Chelodontis fantasticus was found by an expedition led by the Galapagos Parks Authority and the Galapagos Conservancy Group that Marcela Mata wrote in a tweet reposted by the two organisations. The minister said that the animal had been believed extinct for over a hundred years but did not provide any further details. According to the Galapagos Conservancy, the only known specimen of this species, commonly known as the Fenadina Island tortoise, was collected during the California Academy of Sciences expedition in April 1906. Whilst thought to be extinct due to volcanic eruptions in past centuries, there have been anecdotal observations indicating that there may indeed still have been a very few left on the island. And guess what? Those people were right. Well, that's it for New and Rediscovered this episode. It's very difficult to cherry-pick only a few specimens and such a wealth of available material. But I sincerely hope that you then, if you're interested in New and Rediscovered species, go and have a look, for example, on the Novataxa blog that you can find with a very simple Google search and you'll see the great wealth of new creatures and rediscovered creatures that are found each month. We'll be back next month with some more. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. First, there's this. And in next month's episode. Okay, I know I said it was going to be in this episode, but I'm afraid we just ran out of room. But next month we do have Carl, his mum and a stuffed albatross. And then there's this. I can't believe that it was the summer of 2017 when we actually re-launched this show. And this time has gone very, very fast. Our friend Lou has set up a Patreon campaign, which is a very real and sensible way that if you want to support not just this show, but the Centre for Fortune and Zoology, you can do so by going to the link here. And in the meantime, Charlotte and I would just like to say thank you very much for your support. Thank you for watching this month's episode, and we hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it, and we hope to see you next time. Goodbye! Well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the end of another episode, and at the end of another month. It's been a long, strange month. But things are, I believe, moving in the right direction. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's helped and everybody who continues to support the Centre for Fortune Zoology and what we do. And if you enjoyed this show, please like us at the link below. Please spread the word about us on social media. You can press this bell button, which I believe means that you are going to be notified every time we put up a new episode. But what I know about social media is something less than I know about brain surgery. So I wouldn't be uh, sure about that. You can like us on Facebook and visit our Facebook page. And you can just be part of the greater CFZ family. 
thank you to all of you. And until next month, be seeing you.